welcome to the show. Once again, we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award winning speaker, Kath Vincent. On the show, Michael Hempseed on how to turn devastating failure into triumph. Tell the truth and still be kind. Rebecca Morgan explains how. Amy McCauley on how fitness can be a pleasure, not a pain. Blame it on the ocean breeze. And in the music slot from Wild Don't Records with Jesse Wild, original music from Wild Taylor. All this and more to wake up your wow. So, Michael, welcome. Thanks for joining us. It's great to be here. Now, you are something of a celebrity for having been on Britain's Got Talent. Yes, although I expect most people you'd have on the show would have done really well. Uh, I failed spectacularly. Oh, so you're actually famous for, for failing. Yes, that's what I'm known for. Wow. And how was the experience? Tell me what happened. Devastating. The experience was devastating. Yeah. So I invented a magic trick and we went through lots of rehearsals. All the rehearsals went really well. It came to the day of filming and I told everyone that I met on the production team that I would need about 20 minutes backstage to set this up. Yeah. And everyone said, that's fine, not a problem. Someone came to me at about 4.30 in the afternoon and they said, we need you on stage now. Oh my God. Yeah. So absolutely nothing was set up properly. Moments before I went on, I was duct taping things together, throwing things in pockets. And I remember standing on the edge of that stage thinking this is almost certainly going to go wrong. This is almost certainly going to be a disaster. Oh, my goodness. And do you know yeah. that moment that you're talking about? Yeah. People have experienced that if they've stood up to give a speech somewhere, oh, yes. if they... You know, we've all been yeah. there, haven't we? Oh, yes, we? absolutely. And I went out, and everything possible that could have gone wrong did go wrong. And everything that could not possibly have gone wrong also <laughs> managed to go wrong. It's like a double whammy. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> it was an absolute disaster. I had 3,000 people in the audience yelling off, off, oh. off at me. And Amanda Holden was absolutely horrible about my teeth. Oh, man. The, do you know, those shows, they kind of make me sick. Yeah. It was a chance you take on a, going on a show like that. And I knew that a few things could have gone wrong, but I never expected that many things to go wrong after I planned it out so carefully. Yeah. So you describe it as devastating. Yes. So tell me. You leave the stage, you've had yes. all 3,000 people shouting off, off, off. Yeah. Like, how did you feel? What went through your mind? What? I, I can't think, imagine. Like, yeah, I literally can't yeah. imagine. And to be honest, I can't even remember the first half hour after that. Yeah. I was just stunned. Yeah. Just thinking, what on earth has happened? And then I think it slowly dawned on me that this wasn't just in front of 3,000 people. This would be broadcast in front of millions and millions of people. Yeah. And... At the time, I thought my career is going to be ruined. No one's ever going to hire me for a job. This is going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I can't even explain the feeling of just dread and horror that this had happened. Yeah. And then how did you come to terms with it? Uh, well, at the time, I was running school camps in the UK. Yeah. And the day after it aired, a group came in. And I was really, really hoping that this group had not seen the most popular oh, no. show on TV. <laughs> uh, they had. As soon as they walked in the door, they started pointing, it's him, it's him. No, I've got an identical twin. Oh, goodness. This is like the start of the rest of your life. This Basically. Is like, it's going to be like this forever. Yeah. yeah. And they all asked what had happened. And I went round and I asked one of them, you know, what's your talent? One said they're good at playing football. One said they're good at dancing. One said they're good at something else. It came to me and I said, my talent is failing. And they all laughed at me. Yeah. I said, no, no, I'm serious. Anyone can fail once. Yeah. That requires no effort and no skill. But to have the talent of failing, you need to fall off the horse, get back up and try again. Yeah. Now, this was a group of teenagers. They didn't give me much feedback then. But afterwards, two or three of them came up to me and they said, we think you're one of the most inspiring people that we've ever met. I just thought, hold on, hold on. <laughs> All I did was make a turkey of myself on national TV. <laughs> I didn't win it or anything like that. I just failed. Yeah. And to be honest, I just thought they were being nice about it. Yeah. But since the second group that came in saw it as well, I told them that. Yeah. And I also got a good reaction out of that group. Mm. 
And I've been telling the story to people ever since. I've told the story to prisoners, to um, doctors, lawyers, accountants, social workers, hundreds of school children. And I almost always get the same reaction. And it took me a really long time to work out why the story is important. And what I realised is that failure stops so many people. Ah, oh, totally. There are so many people that won't apply for a better job, even if they hate their job, yeah. because they're scared of getting rejected. Yeah. A lot of people, after work, if they're lonely, they won't say to their mates, do you want to come out for a drink or something like that, in case they get rejected. Yeah, people are certainly afraid of failing. You know, no yeah. question. It's, it, it stops people from doing what they really could do. And it was only probably about two years after I'd been giving this talk to thousands of people that I started to realise the impact that this was having on people. Yeah. So tell me now, do you, do you still regret doing... <laughs> yeah. What did you say? Making a turkey of yourself Basically. on TV. <laughs> well, the incredible thing is, I think, you know, even if I'd done really well on the show, that would have been that and it would have been over. Yeah. But by sharing the story of failure, I've been invited to speak all over New Zealand and to thousands and thousands of people. Yeah. So it's actually opened more doors for me than um, actually winning the thing probably would have. Yeah. And I guess once you've confronted that kind of failure... I mean, what else is there to be scared of? That's the brilliant mm -hmm. thing. I did a TEDx talk last year, and people said, are you nervous? I thought, well, not really, because even if I trip up as I walk up the stairs onto the stage, it doesn't matter. I failed more spectacularly than that, <laughs> so why not? So what you're saying is that actually the, the process of failing has yes. given you confidence. It's liberating, because no matter what I do now, I cannot possibly fail that spectacularly ever again. Wow. And actually, I mean, this must feel like a breeze to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll just go on TV. You know? I, was a, I was a little nervous before. <laughs> I mean, I still get nervous. Well, we're not going to humiliate you. And actually, the, those shows, gosh, they really, they're horrible. They're really yes. horrible to people. They can be, yes. So tell me, what are you doing now? So I run an HR company, however, I call it my hobby. But it's a bit more than a hobby. I go around talking to people about failure. Yeah. And I could imagine that prisoners that have been had some terrible experiences would like my story. But then I found business professionals like this. Yeah. And I realised even some incredibly successful people were always looking over their shoulder. Yeah. And they always thought, you know, even if I've made millions of dollars, even if I've got a great reputation, what if tomorrow I fail? Yeah. People are always living with this. And you have your own radio show. I do, yes. Yeah. It's called Lighthouse of Hope and looks at various topics around mental illness. Yeah. Um, and mental illness has become a, a kind of prime topic for you, hasn't it? Very much so. After doing some research, I found out that a third to a half of all suicides are not the result of a long history of depression. They're the result of what's called a same-day crisis, where right. someone experienced a breakup, they were fired from a job, or they were humiliated. Right. In other words, some kind of failure. Yeah. And we don't teach people how to fail in this country. When everyone runs a race at school, you get a certificate of participation. Even if you're dead last, yeah. you still get a certificate <laughs> of participation. Yeah. In real life, if you experience a breakup, you do not get a certificate of participation. Yeah. But we protect people from failure. But then when they get out into the real world and they inevitably fail, people really struggle to manage that. Yeah. What should we be doing? How should we be managing failure or preparing people for failure in the world? People might think this is um, an odd thing to say. Let people fail. Yeah. Let people get used to failure. Yeah. The fear of failure is so much worse than actually failing. And when I failed on Britain's Got Talent, I remember thinking my career was going to be finished. Actually, today, I'm incredibly happy. I've got a great job. I got married last August. Oh, congratulations. And things are going well. Congratulations. Thank you. So although I thought it was going to ruin my life, it didn't. Yeah. I think that is a great message for everyone in the world. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us, Michael. My pleasure. Next up, Rebecca Morgan on Kinder Communication. So, Rebecca, welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to be here. This is my... First time in New Zealand, so oh, I'm wow. happy to be with you, happy to be in New Zealand. How cool. So you've flown in from Silicon Valley. Via Cape Town <laughs> in Australia, yes. Wow, yes. so you're, you're on a big tour right now. Yeah, eight weeks speaking tour. Wow, that's exciting. And listen, you have done a heap of work with companies of all sizes. Um, so executive coaching. Tell me a bit about the kinds of problems that you, you help coaching. 
It's all about people. And even if they're executives or managers, they may have been promoted because of their technical expertise, but not necessarily because of their people expertise. So yeah. I help them be more effective with people. That's an interesting point you raise. So often people are almost promoted beyond their competence. You know, they're good, 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 good. Promoted, <laughs> uh, not good. Yes. Uh. So, so typically what kind of problems would you work on? Well, a lot of them are just knowing how to communicate with their people in a way that is empowering and inspiring and motivating versus demotivating or humiliating in some cases. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of people don't have that formal training in how to manage staff or how to inspire people. So how do you get around that? So some of them actually think it's common sense. So they would not take a seminar or engage a coach until there's been a problem. Yeah. Or if they're really on the ball, they will say, I, no matter how good I am, I can always be better. Yeah. And they will engage somebody like me to either do a seminar for their company or a keynote for their company or work with them individually. Yeah, that's a really good point that you make because actually I think people think that speaking is common sense. We all grow up speaking, you know, yes. we know how to do it. And yet when it comes to that communication for effectiveness, perhaps we're a bit lacking. Right, and unless they really notice the impact of their words on other people, they're just oblivious and they go around doing whatever they would do and they're leaving a trail of disaster behind them, both personally and professionally. Yeah, so, so people will contact you when they see a problem, they realize their communication has created something. What kinds of problems are, are occurring? Well, often it's they have not told their staff that there is an issue with their performance until the annual evaluation. Right. And so then the staff, the employee says, why didn't you tell me earlier? I could have been working on this all year versus just waiting once a year. And then the employees resent it. They, they are not motivated. They will often leave mm. because of the manager's ineffectiveness. You know, it's, it's about knowing when to speak and when not to speak, maybe. Right. So I've created, so I just released my 26th book last year. Oh, my goodness. Called, called um, uh, Extraordinary Leadership Lessons from Everyday People. And wow. in it, while I was working on this, I thought about this issue that you raised. And I thought, well, really, there's a continuum of honesty and knowing when and how to be honest and when not to or when to hold back a little bit. So on this end is the completely honest. They will say anything that's on their mind. They tell you anything, whether you want to hear it or not, yeah. right? And you're kind of like, oh, I shouldn't be hearing right, this, right. yeah. <laughs> and then on the other end is more of a filtered. So this is unfiltered, this is the filtered in. And those are the people who are so timid that they don't say anything. And these are those executives or managers who don't speak up when there is a performance issue that could be improved. Yeah. So on a, let's just take a personal example on the continuum. So if you have a new pair of jeans yeah. and you say, so Rebecca, do these jeans make me look? Fat. Fat, exactly, yes. thank you, fat. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm a blurter. <laughs> no, but I wanted you to blurt. It's okay, I invited you to blurt. So I have to decide where on that continuum do I share with you my opinion about this yeah. and how to share my opinion. So if we're really good mates and I think you, oh, we're friends and you can, I can say anything to you, then I'll be more on this end and say, you know, Kath, those are probably not the best cut for you. You know, yeah. I'm going to finesse how I say it, right? So I'm maybe not all the way to the end, but I'm close. I'm telling you really what yeah. I think would be in your best interest. If I barely know you and I want to stay on your good side or I'm afraid of how the repercussions, I'm more likely to be on this end and say, oh, Kath, you look great in everything. Yeah. Right. So as an executive, you are a manager, you have to decide where on this continuum is going to best serve the outcome that I want. So what advice can you give, depending on which end of the spectrum you're at? So you know, how, do, how do we solve this? So I try to get people to be more introspective and step back and think a moment before whatever comes out of their mouth comes out of their mouth. <laughs> plop and then you can't get it back. Yeah. So what <laughs> outcome would you like out of this? Yeah. Would you like to create a stronger alliance? And if you need to be on the end that is a blurter, then how can I phrase it? How can I finesse it? So it's not painful or harmful to the person. It doesn't get in the way of the relationship. Yeah. And, you know, whether someone is timid or aggressive, you know, whichever end of the spectrum, is that personality? Is it environment? You know, what, why do we choose one end over another? I find it's just behavior and humans tend to do what they perceive has worked yes. in the past. So you, if it has worked once, 
then that's the data they have. And so they think, oh, well, this will work every time, even yeah. though we know it doesn't. Yeah. And actually, that's from childhood, isn't it? We find a way to get what we want or to survive in the world or whatever. Exactly. And yeah. we don't modify that a lot. Some of us do. Some of us really work at being the best that we can be. Yeah. But others think what what I'm doing was working, so I might as well keep doing it. Yep, this is my way, take it or leave it. That's right. Yeah, That's right. okay. So how easy then is it for a person to change that behavior? I think personally it's the thinking. It's just the stepping back before you open your mouth or put finger to keyboard in some cases. Just yeah. thinking, what is it I want to have as a result of this and how would I best go about that? Not in a manipulative way, just in a strategic way. Yeah. Yeah, and a, and a kind of, you know, getting along in the world kind of way too. You know, the, those kind of areas of conflict don't really serve anyone. No, and I find family members tend to be more on this end. Yeah. They tend to think, well, I'm your mom, I can say whatever I want. And they have no idea how hurtful those comments can be and how they can last for decades. Yeah. And as Michael pointed out, how they can get in the way of you really having confidence to take risks and try new things. Yeah. Because your, your mom said something, your dad said something, or a coach or a teacher that has really prevented you from going further. Yeah. And actually, you've been on 60 Minutes. You've been on Oprah as well. I have. I have. Oh, we're in good company. Yes. You're not Oprah. <laughs> Oprah. That's great. That's great. OK. And, um, and what did you share with Oprah? Uh, I was on Oprah's show because one of my 26 books is on how to calm down upset customers. Oh. So I was on as the expert for customers from hell. Oh, yeah. And so <laughs> we. she liked my, my show so much, she chose to show it again when she was on vacation. And they say they only... She only chooses her favorite shows of the year yeah. to show again. Cool. Well, maybe I will show this show. It's, uh, it's <laughs> great. It's great. But before we wrap up, what would your top tip be for executives on the subject of communication or d difficult conversations of any kind? Mm, mostly it's be conscious of what your outcome, your desired outcome is, and step back and be thoughtful. Um, uh, you can be candid, but you, you candor with kindness. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Candor with kindness. Yeah. Great tip. Thank you. Okay. Now, if you've been watching the show, you know that I'm rather hastily committed to write a book in 30 days. In fact, I'm going to dictate it using Dragon software. Now, the exciting thing is, if you've always wanted to write a book, you can join our Facebook and get all the support you need from everyone else who is also committed to writing their book. You know you want to. Give it a go. Next up, Amy McCauley putting joy back into fitness. Welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, hey, I can see you here with, uh, is it actually a hula hoop? I can see it's called power hoop, but yes. tell me, what do you call this implement? This one's a power hoop, right. power hoop deluxe. Ooh, yeah. now tell me, what is power hooping? Power hooping, well, it is based on the principle of hula hooping, yeah. um, but it, power hooping has, um, obviously it's quite different in terms of it's much heavier, it got comes with weights, um, and it's it's got the interior ridge there. So it's, it's about 70% more effective than a hula hoop. So it's designed to really strengthen up all your core muscles. By hooping with it, you're going to be getting a trimmer waist, flatter tummy, stronger back and slimmer hips. Sounds brilliant. It's awesome. We've actually got someone demonstrating yeah. it right now. <laughs> Woo, look at her go. <laughs> I'm glad she's doing it because I'm wearing a skirt today, so I'm, I'm not doing it. But listen, how long have you been how, power, power, power hooping? hooping. Power, power hooping. hooping. <laughs> I uh, first discovered power hooping, it must be nearly six years ago, yeah. back in Scotland. It's Scotland. I can hear that accent. It's fabulous. <laughs> I'm not listening to a word you say. It just sounds awesome. <laughs> um, so I've discovered it back in a ladies' gym that I was working in uh, way back then and I just fell in love with it. I could not... It was in an exercise class and it was, you know, loads of people hooping and having so much fun with it. And I, I smiled from ear to ear that first time I, I did my class. So I just was like, I need to um, do this more. Like, I couldn't believe exercise could be so much fun. Yeah. Up until then, I used to think exercise should be more punishing, not fun. Well, so. it's interesting because it, it, mm. I think exercising for a lot of people is one of those things that, oh, I'm supposed to do, yeah. I have to do, I should yep. do, that kind of thing. Mm. But this does seem a little bit different. Yeah, and that's what I sort of, that's what really caught, captured my imagination back then. I knew I was emigrating to New Zealand and I had no idea what I was going to do when I came here. But I, what I could see was, I could see how much this was um, 
really appealing to people, like people that hate or ordinarily hated exercise or were allergic to exercise. Yeah. And they were coming along to these classes and they kept coming. They were coming two, three times a week. Yeah. And they were just like, it was kind of like they were being reconnected with their inner child. Yeah. So what, yeah. what happens in a class? How long is it and how yeah. does it work? Well, we've been running, I've been running classes in, in my area for about four years now. And we use the hoop for a variety of different exercises because it's got the weights in it. We use it for upper body workouts. We use, we do a little bit of aerobic style training yeah. and uh, lower body. So it's a full body workout. It really is an amazing, incredible workout. People are always really surprised when they come to class yeah. that it's quite so intense. But they also can't believe how much fun they have. That's yeah. the key thing for me. So I know so many people grew up hula hooping, but I didn't. Like, I'm pretty sure I don't know how to do <laughs> <laughs> Would I be able to bow a hoop or not? So many people say that when they when they first see a power hooping or they hear yeah. about the classes, and they're like, I can't do it because I can't hula hoop. Um, and I say to them, absolutely no, I still cannot hula hoop after six, you know, five, five or six years of hooping. Oh, really? Yep, because this is much easier because of the weights and the thicker diameter in the right. hoop. Um, therefore, it, the hooping really does suit all ages, all shapes, all sizes, all levels of fitness. Oh, it cool. really does. Um, and, and, and it's really easy to pick up. Well, this awesome lady is still going. <laughs> so it would be a workout. Yeah. But listen, so, yes. so what's she demonstrating right now? So hoop, I mean, the basic hooping technique is just when you're just standing and hooping. And what we recommend people do is about 10 to 15 minutes every day. Um, to get really maximum results. So, but we in the class we do add a little bit of you know movement with the hoop, mm -hmm. and obviously we, we we don't just hoop the whole time. It's yeah. about forty five minutes to an hour an hour long for yeah. the whole class. So you could literally do just 10 to 15 minutes at home and that's that's your workout then? Yeah, I mean, obviously um, it's in conjunction with other exercising. I recommend people, you know, do other things like walking and, and, and other exercise too. But this is for your core strength. I mean, for me, when I, um, when I had, I've got three children and after each kid, I had a really terrible back ache. I had suffered sciatica really badly. Yeah. And by doing my 10 to 15 minutes every day for five years since I've been hooping, I have not had any bad back at mm. all. So it's really, really good just to do that, that consistency of doing at home every day will make a big difference to your core strength yeah um and consistency mm. is important isn't it oh of course it is, yeah. Yeah. i yeah. think everyone's always looking for the quick fix mm. oh, oh hula yeah. hoop for 10 minutes a day and i'm done yeah and that's not really the story at oh, all it's is about it? strengthening up your core it's um you know it helps me it energizes you makes you feel really good and what it does and i notice with a lot of my customers is when they find this exercise that they fall in love with then what they do is it catapults them into trying other stuff yeah so i've got lots of my customers who are now running marathons um honestly Honestly, um, even myself, it's catapulted me into trying new exercises as well. So how has your life changed since you started this? Uh, oh, like, I could not even begin to explain how much it's changed. Try, okay. try. <laughs> um, well, prior to, to finding an exercise that I loved, um, I had body issues for a long, long time. Right. Um, so what, you felt you were overweight or...? Yeah, I just had... I, I suffered from an eating disorder for, for many years and... Mm. and, uh, and postnatal depression many times and go after each kid and just yeah I know what it's like to feel not happy in your own body yeah. um, and then when I first discovered power hooping it kind of catapulted many changes in my life I could not um, speak to more than two people at one time I had major issues in terms of confidence yeah. so I had a big big challenge ahead of me to, to grow a business um, you know that's to... very hard to believe as you sit here now you know yeah. looking amazing yeah. that's really well, hard to imagine I've done a lot of work on myself a lot of work um, and you know I've grown my business I've now got instructors all over the country teaching these classes and I you know I've got a dream I've got a goal and I do believe anything is possible. Um, I think the key difference for me now is that I do believe in myself. Yeah. And um, that has helped me so much. It's helped me grow business. It's helped me develop myself personally. Wow, yeah. that's powerful. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us well, on the show. That's my pleasure. Thank Delicious. you for, so much for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Next up, the Wild Records music slot with Jessie Wilde. Jessie Wilde, welcome back. Great to be here. So listen, tell us, have you got a surprise for us today? Who's in the studio? Well, I do have a bit of a surprise because uh, today it's going to be my new duo Ooh. called Wild Taylor. Mm, and that's you, Wild, with... Well, I've been recently working with a jazz guitarist named Ed Taylor. Yeah. And this is one of his songs. And we're also being joined by Matt Shanks on bass. Of course, you play bass, don't you? Yeah, not the double bass, though. Blimey. No. I could. Oof. Anyway, I'll be dying to hear that. So well, let's, let's take let's a look. Do it. Blame 
it on the moonlight Blame it on the cheap wine Blame it on the starry skies Blame it on his cruel eyes Blame it on the springtime Blame it on the firelight Blame it on the ocean breeze Just don't blame it on me Don't blame it on me Don't you blame it on me Blame it on getting high Blame it on a sheltered life Blame it on your moody blues Whatever helps get you through Blame it on that handsome man And the way he held your hand Oh, but darling, please Don't you blame it on me Awesome, blimey, you're tall, aren't you? Thank you. <laughs> oh, and I got and I got a kiss as well. <laughs> so that was fantastic. So this is your new duo. The two of you are playing together. How, how long have you been playing? Pretty six months or so, I think. Yeah, cool. It's been that long. <laughs> <laughs> now listen, Ed, you composed that song. Yes. Where did it come from? Uh, it was a little riff that I've been sort of fiddling around with for maybe a year, and then um, I sort of came up with the words. Just one afternoon thinking about things. So the music took a year and the words took an afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it usually like that? How, how does it normally work when you're writing? Uh, I normally sort of, as I said, I, I fiddle around with some guitar stuff and then think of a lyric that sort of suits yeah. uh, that, that music. Yeah. Yeah. And so what happened when the two of you got together? How did the duo work out? Well, I was looking for a singer uh, for a particular gig that I do couple times a week yep. and I looked on the internet and I found this young man over here's name and um <laughs> young <laughs> young <laughs> so I, and so I, <laughs> young and handsome young and handsome he these ticked are. all the boxes so yeah. uh yeah we started playing together and we had a good rapport and it was fun so yeah. we sort of moved along from there eh? cool yeah, I got a phone call from Ed I get a lot of phone calls, you know, and uh, Ed seemed like a great From Ed. <laughs> Ed seemed like a you know, pretty switched on guy, and we got together, very casual and uh, great guitarist, yeah. great jazz player. And, um, you know, initially the gig was about, um, we do, well, Ed plays twice a week at the Lumsden Cafe in Newmarket. Yeah, and that's in Freehouse. Auckland, yeah. And, um, and then, of course, being a songwriter, I said, oh, have you written any songs? And... 
And he said, yeah, I have, and I've got, I've got a few songs that would fit this style. So now we're working on an album together and uh, keeping it real, doing some covers, doing some originals. And yeah. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. My thanks to all my special guests, to Michael, to Rebecca, to Amy and Pam, to Ed and Matt, and, of course, our very own Jesse Wilde. And until next time, don't wait to wake up your wow. Yeah. 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 Yeah.